In the year of off-season curveballs for Ohio State, here comes another one. And it's going to change the plan for the podcast daily on Thursday. We don't have time, Berm, for defensive stonks today, just like we planned. We'll get to it eventually. But when Ohio State's longest tenured assistant coach, right, tied with Larry Johnson, uh, that one, or Larry Johnson has one more year, when one, their longest no. tenured offensive coach leaves for the school's biggest rival, we probably need to come back and talk a little bit more about Tony Off. So he's Jeremy Birmingham. I'm Austin Ward. This is the podcast daily. So we we did some snappy J's on this on Wednesday, Berm, but uh, I don't know anything else that came to your mind about this move and what it means since then. No, I mean, I think context is always important that people are going to, uh, you're going to see a lot of opinions that were like well-formed and, and, and solid over the last nine years, all of a sudden change from people like you see Michigan folks who had spent the last year laughing at Tony Alford because he didn't land Jordan Marshall over Michigan. Now t- saying that Tony Alford coming to Michigan means it's a huge win for them because he's an elite recruiter. Uh, I mean, these are the things that you're going to see. You're going to see, obviously, the Ohio State side. People are going to try to um, downplay the success Tony Alford's had as a as a developer of talent and, and the production in the room, even though you know, but then you'll have the other side say, well, he's only had one running back that he recruited and developed to get to the NFL, and that's J.K. Dobbins. So is he any good at this job or not? Like, it's just going to be a lot of this sort of, uh, um, you know, revisionist history. Um, I, I'm I'm seeing a lot of people who were uh, upset or not agreeing with my belief or, or the comment that I made in Snap Judgments presented by Byers Auto that um, it, it was a win for Michigan over Ryan Day and I'm not sure how it could be viewed as anything other than that. I mean, especially from the outside looking in or from the Michigan side, like, you know, people without the luxury of understanding the inner dynamics of Ohio State and maybe how things have been playing out there in the last few months with Tony Alford. Um, but uh, from the outside looking in, and especially from Michigan's side, the team that just won the national championship, by the way, like they're going to definitely celebrate this as a huge win over Ryan Day and Ohio State. So, um, yeah. Is it? I don't know that it is, but it certainly will be couched in that way. I mean, Michigan will definitely feel that way. And in this exact moment, there's no way to say that Ohio State has counter punched so that it doesn't offset their program or set them back or that it does count as a true loss. If they're able to hire DeMarco Murray and get him into Ohio State in the Woody Hayes Athletic Center, in the next couple of weeks or before spring football is over, a person who also interviewed for that Michigan job and who has a great reputation uh, already as a recruiter and uh, position coach at Oklahoma with running backs, then Ohio State may say, you know what? We had a great run with Tony Alford. He was here long enough, but maybe this this is better for the future of the program. Or the same thing if you hire a position coach from Alabama. Or, um, you know, I, I don't know a ton about the option at Georgia Tech, down there with uh, Vernal McKenzie, but um, Norval. there's a Norval. Norval. Sorry, I can't even get his name right. I it's that's how new he is to me. But you know, with these guys, with Gillespie, Alabama, Murray at Oklahoma, if they strike, if they take that big swing and connect and strike while the iron's hot for them, all right. Well, maybe it won't be the win for Michigan that they feel it is right now. But in the moment, how else could they uh, view it? Like they took a coach from Ohio State across the lines of the rivalry like that rarely happens yeah a coach that has a position room with Trayvon Henderson and Quinshawn Judkins and Dallin Hayden who's just viewed as the best in the country a coach that left in the middle of spring practice like there's a lot of reasons to be like even though as we said like there was a lot of discussion about Alfred and, and maybe whether or not his tenure was coming to an end back in January but once you pass that threshold of like February 15th you start to say okay well this is the way it's going to be so like all of those things make it feel like a loss for Ohio State. But to your point, how you replace Tony Alford is what ultimately will tell the tale here. Ohio State, it, it's something that they've done extremely well since the Urban Meyer era. If they lose a guy in the recruiting trail, they find a way to get someone that is considered an upgrade by most accounts. And they've done that in the coaching positions as well. So, um, you know, when you lose Mike Vrabel back in 2013 and you replace him with Larry Johnson, like that's considered a, a win nationally. When you, when you look um, at Parker Fleming or, or, you know, Corey Dennis to Chip Kelly, like Parker Fleming to James Laurinaitis, like these are upgrades. 
Ohio State has generally done a pretty darn good job with upgrades. Again, and we talked about it on Snap Judgments, like the only thing that I think puts a little bit of uh, a, of rain clouds on, on this attempt at a sunny uh, approach here <laughs> is that it's March, and it becomes much harder to convince people to walk away from their job, I think, in, in, in mid-March than it would have been two months ago. It may not wind up being harder, but it might be more expensive. Um, yeah. And I think that is one other benefit that Ohio State has working for it here. It, the eventual candidate may not come from these first three names that that we've heard. We'll see what transpires there. Again, there has to be uh, a lot more sense of urgency for Ryan Day to make this move and make the replacement higher than any of the other things that were going on in December and January uh, because of the nature of the room and the transfer portal and the fact that spring ball has already started. So these other coaches will know that. I mean, DeMarco Murray doesn't have to leave his alma mater and Ohio State may have to make an, an offer that he simply can't refuse, which it, it feels like that's what Tony Alford views the one that he got from Michigan, an extra essentially million dollars based on that third guaranteed year, uh, our understanding of the deal that he got to leave Ohio State. Uh, you can understand why a position coach would not want to turn down that much money, even though there are a lot of other things that probably were enticing him to stay at Ohio State. Now, the same can be true uh, for a coaching staff in transition at Alabama. I, I don't know those coaches personally. I don't know what will motivate them uh, on the next step of their career. But A, it's Ohio State. The power of the brand is very well known. They have a roster that is ready to compete for a national championship as it does virtually every single year. The recruiting uh, infrastructure is well in place. And the current roster is arguably the best at running back in the entire country with Travion Henderson, Quinshawn Judkins, and Dallin Hayden at the top. So that's the sales pitch. Will everybody want to jump at that in March? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, will they be able to land one of the top two to three candidates? You have to think that Ohio State has a pretty good chance of doing that. Uh, it just had to go through the same sort of process on a, a much larger scale with Bill O'Brien and Chip Kelly, and they had the financial wherewithal to make the move that they needed to. And we argue, we argued then, like, did this actually work out better for Ohio State? There's a chance that that could happen at running back as well. Uh, and you've made the points. So we've both talked about this a number of times. Like, having an assistant for that amount of time you know, can be a negative as well. A fresh start could very well help Ohio State, especially if they're looking. And that's not, I'm not suggesting that as a knock on Tony Alford or a, it may yeah, be a it, silver it lining. A fresh start may be good for Tony Alford as well. I mean, that's, it's, yeah. it's it is part of the equation. Yeah. It, it's, it's just an opportunity, not, it is not throwing dirt on Tony Alford on his way out the door by any stretch of the imagination. I'm not trying to revise that. I think he, was a tremendous asset for Ohio State over the last nine years. Uh, my feelings on that will not change, and I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, alter his resume in any way. But you have an opportunity now that is in your lap. Ohio State didn't want it, or they wouldn't have offered him a contract and a raise to stay from what they had previously discussed in the offseason. So, uh, you know, we'll see what it, how they actually tackle it from here. But as you said, that this particular offseason. They've not only had to do this, but they had to replace Corey Dennis and Parker Fleming, and they've done that by by what appears to be enhancing the overall staff in the process. Yeah, and if it's about money, which a lot of times these things do work out to being about money, I mean, the Buckeyes, the offer that was on the table for Tony Alford is nearly 25% more than DeMarco Murray or Robert Gillespie made in 2023. So the, the financial side of it is there for Ohio State. To, to be able to answer those questions. Um, the, the biggest thing for Ryan Day and, and Chip Kelly is figuring out who the right fit is. And I, I don't know uh, from talking to people on Wednesday afternoon before this became public, like, is there, is there a sense of, of rush, rush, rush? Does it have to be done in the next week or two? And the answer is no. As long as they have the right guy in, the, in place by April 13th, I think that they feel comfortable um, moving at whatever pace that is dictated by or whatever pace that dictates. But what you do have to do is make sure that Travion Henderson and Quinchon Judkins are involved in the process from here until April 13th. Like you can't try to do this in a way that these players are not kept in the loop. I mean, we're seeing 
some social media reaction on Wednesday afternoon, guys like Sam Williams Dixon posting like, wow. And all the stuff like this stuff is a surprise to people when you're a coach at Ohio state and, and you spend, as we talked about on, on Wednesday, like months talking about Michigan and how you hate those guys and how you have to, how you have to approach that game. And then all of a sudden your coach leaves for that school. I think that you can be put into a position where certainly you are like, on edge of not knowing if you could trust anyone anymore because that's a it's a pretty um that's a pretty deep chasm to to try and crawl out of when, when you're dealing with that sort of of decision so um day and, and chip kelly are going to have some interesting conversations over the next month but it's not i don't think it has to hurry it just has to be right and it has to be done by the end of uh, end of middle of april yeah i, I think that's interesting berm i mean i that is a timeline. Yeah, like there is a, a deadline. You you feel like that's got to be in place, and I don't I don't know that you want if it's any of these people or or literally any other candidate them to spend their entirety of a spring camp working spring. with another program and like not with Travion Henderson and Quinshawn Judkins and Dallin Hayden to get this thing all sorted out because we expect you know and Ryan Day has already talked about this with Chip Kelly with tweaks and and. Uh, new schemes and and different approaches for the rushing attack. So you want to coach that and you want to have the person who's going to coach it on hand to get as many of those opportunities as possible. Now there's 13 of them left uh, starting on Tuesday. And so every single one that you miss, you don't get back. There's plenty of them twice as many in August. So that the time can in some ways be made up, but uh, or at least you would have a full training camp in the entire summer if that's the way it works. But it's it's just hard to sit there and, and believe in this day and age that not only just from getting through spring practice, which is important enough for the running backs and for the program as a whole, but and then not just the portal after that, but having a clear plan in place and then not letting somebody spend any of that extra time on another program if you can help it. Like that's why it feels it's different than Parker Fleming to James Laurinaitis in in almost every way. And that's why I feel like it doesn't have to be done by Sunday. But, but it'd be good week, if it could be. Oh, yeah. But a week and a half, like if you only miss two or three practices, and I, I can't hold anybody to this. Like, I, I'm just saying there's got to be a ma- some amount of time that Ryan Day feels like it's got to be done so that the, the next coach spends time with the co- with the players. It happens before the portal. They learn the offense. They get the opportunities to coach half of a camp and understand what, what they're building towards. And and you get that done and you just move forward. Like nobody wanted it to happen on this particular timeline. Nobody thought Tony Alford would be leaving for Michigan, but that's the hand that they're dealt now. And they don't have two months to get it right. I, I think that would cause way more problems. Yeah. And there's also the little uh, matter of recruiting, which obviously you're now in the middle of the spring uh, dead, per- dead period, quiet period. Sorry, where kids are allowed to visit campus. A lot of kids are visiting campus. Two weeks from now, the number one ranked running back in the country, Jordan Davison from California, is supposed to be on campus for a four-day trip with Ohio State. Whether or not uh, that trip happens is now very much in the air, obviously, because you don't know who the running backs coach is going to be or even if there will be one there. So the faster you can find that guy, the better, um, especially if it's a guy like Gillespie or DeMarco Murray who are at you know who are nationally renowned um, recruiting guys, uh, players, uh, players love – DeMarco Murray. I mean, we remember back when Trevion Henderson was being recruited, DeMarco Murray was the one coach that had a real chance at swaying him away from Ohio State. And uh, I suppose there'd be some, you know, welcome reception for him if, if he was ended up being the guy by by at least Trevion Henderson. So, you know, you do have to inform a lot of the decisions that get made over these next few weeks on on this track. Like, how does Trey feel about it? How does Quinshawn feel about it? And is this guy going to be ready to go? Because it, to your point, like you don't want to have a guy showing up on April the 11th and being like, okay, he's your coach now. Like yeah. it, it's beneficial for everyone to see the style in play, to see how does this guy work on a, in a meeting? How does this guy work on the field uh, and make sure that that the chemistry is where you want it? Because these kids do have some major decisions to make. And even though you can enter the transfer portal and withdraw your name, like nobody wants to open that door. So uh, Ohio state certainly wants to have this done within the next week or two but th- they're not going to rush into it i don't think um if if the right guy isn't there now the question is who's the right guy and 
you know, those three names that we've already talked about, DeMarco Murray, Robert Gillespie, and Norval McKenzie, which is a fun name, honestly. I Yeah, I'll have it drilled into my head by now. I mean, that's literally Wednesday morning was the first time I had ever heard of that person. Yeah, it's not going to be Eddie George. It's not going to be Maurice Claret. It's not going to be Ezekiel Elliott. Like, it's not going to be. It doesn't have to be someone who played at Ohio State. I understand that people like that when that's the case. But, um, you know, Pepe Pearson, who's at Tarleton State or something like that, after a couple of years working with Eddie George, like, I don't know that that's the leap that Ohio State wants to make either. I mean, let's be honest. It, it, he's been a FCS uh, or a, what, what division now is Tennessee State in? I don't even know. Yeah, uh, one double A, I believe. But one double A. If he's been in that that division for a couple of years and hasn't been promoted to D one, it makes you, you know, maybe that's not where Ohio State of all places is going to turn their attention. So uh, you're going to be looking for an experienced coach who's a little bit younger, who understands the position, probably played the position, and somebody that has a, a reputation as being a, a a home run hitter as a recruiter and. Um, that list is going to be pretty small, but it's Ohio State, and no one in the country has the, the swagger that they do when they walk into a room and say, hey, we want you. I can just, but I can hear everybody chanting it right now. Like, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie. Listen, you know and I you, Eddie and you were And you were the one that was encouraging it. But he's the head coach at Tennessee State. He's not going to leave. So he's already said he's not going to leave. Like, he's not going to leave. So if that's the way it goes, that's the way it goes. Um, I, I do think that there are, people out there that fit the profile of what Ohio State needs um, just as well as Eddie George. Who? Who else you got on there? Um, those three guys we already mentioned. Oh, oh, oh okay. I mean, but no, I mean, you know, I mentioned Deuce Staley. I, I on, thought, yeah, I thought you might have a couple more up your sleeve. I mentioned Deuce Staley on the snap judgments. I, I don't think that's the right fit. It's probably not a guy who's been in college coaching, so I don't think you want to run the risk of bringing in someone who's just going to be here for a year and decide, hey, I want to go back to the NFL. So, I, I don't exactly know, but I, I know uh, Mike Merritt down at Miami. Uh, you, you know, Mike, he was an assistant for Ohio State uh, and a GA for the Buckeyes back into the Urban Meyer era. Like he's been skyrocketing up the uh, coaching ranks, and he's now the running backs coach at Miami, just hired there about a month and a half ago when they didn't get Tony Alford. So that's a name I would at least kind of have in the back of my mind a little bit. He's a young guy. Um, very familiar with Ohio and, and Ohio recruiting because of his time in the state. So that's that's another guy that maybe if you're talking about not the biggest names that I would be looking at. Landis uh, immediately dipped into his knowledge of Philadelphia sports on Wednesday and was like, I wonder if anybody remembers when DeMarco Murray like went to the Eagles ownership and undermined Chip Kelly. That seems to be like the only hang up. If he is the a number one candidate and those two have what appears to be a rocky history i wonder if that has been repaired in some form or fashion if the fact that they're both professional adults in the in the coaching world now if that is different than a player coach dynamic from almost a decade ago uh that was the only thing that you look at it's like okay ohio state can offer more money they've got the running back room they're well aware of the opportunity to take his, his coaching career to perhaps to the next level he knows Chip Kelly and, and some of the offensive schemes and what he wants to do um, with the system. Has some familiarity with Ryan Day. Like all those things sit right there. And it's like that could be the perfect marriage. And then and then Landis puts in a headline like DeMarco Murray has no faith in Chip Kelly. It's like cool. Yeah, but as you mentioned, it is a little bit different when you're a player and, and it's a head coach and now you're an adult. You're you're in the same business. I think maybe once you cross that line, once you moonlight Gramit and you cross, you know, <laughs> the first baseline and you're like, okay, I'm a coach now. Like, I think you maybe see things a little bit different. I hope that you see things a little bit different than you did when you were a player whose salary depended on how many times that guy got you the football or how many <laughs> wins you had. So I think it's probably a little different. And bottom line, Ryan Day, for all of the things that people will criticize about him. Like he is really, really excellent when he gets one-on-one -on -one with people and has an opportunity to recruit himself. Um, so I, I think if, if DeMarco Murray interviewed for the Michigan job, which we firmly believe he did, we were told he did, then he's obviously got a mind for uh, opening up some other opportunities or exploring opportunities. So 
he'd be, I think it'd be silly if he didn't at least have a conversation with Ohio State because it's not like the situation is now that different from what he interviewed with with Michigan since it was happening right, you know, at the beginning of spring. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a case to be made that Ohio State has way more to offer DeMarco Murray than Michigan did, which then begs the question back and takes us back to the, to the start of it. It's like, then why did Tony Alford want that job when he was already in Columbus? Um, I think it did come down to about $950,000, but um, only Tony Alford can really answer that. Uh, this, the other part of that is like, why would it, uh, an Alabama position coach who just went through some of this offseason stuff like Robert Gillespie, why would he be interested? Uh, our understanding is that he wasn't sure he was going to be retained when Kalen DeMoor, DeBoer arrived, and there is a, a period of uncertainty going on there for Alabama with its roster and its fundraising. Uh, and if he feels like there's a, a chance maybe to secure his future while also, again, taking advantage of some of the other things that we've talked about that the Buckeyes have to offer, I think that's why uh, the door is open there for Ohio State not just they don't have to go look at like an up and comer they they should be able to take a couple of the very be best position coaches or at least get interviews with them and make the Ryan Day sales pitch um the the door should be cracked for that i think that's why there is not some need to skip down and and settle if that's if that's the right word for it they they can take the biggest swings imaginable and i and i bet that they'll be able to hit one yeah, and for a guy like Gillespie, if you're one of the few coaches that's retained on an outgoing coaching staff, your position is anything but like solid. Like you are constantly on alert. You're the ground is tenuous. You are the first guy when things go wrong that will be moved on from by Kalen DeBoer because he has less loyalty to you. Uh, so I think it makes sense for a guy like Gillespie to be interested. Um, but again, everyone's going to be interested because it's Ohio State and they have the two best running backs maybe in the country playing in the same backfield. So any coach is going to see that as an opportunity to quickly elevate themselves into the national discussion. Um, and a guy that's already in the national discussion, like Gillespie, uh, you know, the, I mean, hell, I mean, to shard choice at Texas is another guy like, I mean, Texas pays a little bit better than most of these schools do. And he obviously played there. That might be a harder sell, but you're Ohio state. There's not a single phone call you shouldn't try to make over these next 48 hours. All right. And they sure will. And as soon as we get any more uh, insight on where Ohio State will go to replace Tony Alford, we'll pass that along as soon as we can, uh, either on subtext or here on the podcast daily or some snap judgments. Who knows? Uh, another fresh round of uh, questions and uncertainty for the Buckeyes to answer and for Ryan Day to tackle. It's just he just cannot get more than a month of normal stuff for him. It's like every single offseason, every single year. There's always something for him to deal with. It's yeah. It's I can only imagine the conversation on Tuesday night when Tony Alford called him and Ryan Day's phone rings and he's thinking it's Alfred who forgot to tell him happy birthday earlier in the day, and he's like, "Hey, Ryan," and Ryan's like, "Oh, great, yeah, thank you. I appreciate you calling. Oh, by the way, <laughs> uh, happy birthday, buddy. I'm Eesh. I'm out of here. Uh, yeah. So anyway, we'll we'll keep working on that and we'll be getting ready. We'll figure out what we're going to do. Can't speak again of the content plan because it's always subject to change for Ohio State, but maybe we'll have some stocks on Friday. Maybe we'll do a mailbag. Who knows? We'll figure it out, and we'll be back here to wrap up the week on a Freaky Friday on the Podcast Daily. For Berm, I am Austin. We will see you then.